For our next great panel from Apple TV Plus is the docu-series The Dynasty, New England Patriots, that not only covers one of the great reigns in NFL history, but one of the great sports reigns in sports history in general. With us today is director and executive producer Matthew Hemacek. Uh, before we get into our Q&A, here's a clip from the series. Just when you think it can't get any worse, 0-2 after a couple of dismal performances, they lose their franchise quarterback. Bledsoe's taken off on a stretcher after the game. Who knows the extent of the injury right now. You think Drew's gone for the season at this point? Or or? Not yet, but uh, it does not look good. Soon. And the Pats will look to 24-year-old Tom Brady, making his first ever NFL start at quarterback. Let me tell you something, the spotlight's gonna be on this guy and see if he can produce. I was the backup quarterback. So coach came over and was like, okay, Drew's out. Tom, you're in. You better get ready to go. I did everything I could do to get ready. And I really approached practice like it was the game. I was like, I'm not taking anything for chance. Because, you know, for Coach Belichick, you're in for this week. In pro football, Nobody's entitled to anything, nobody gets anything. You have to go out there and work for it and perform at a level at which you earn it. Each week, we all have to prove ourselves competitively to each other and to our teammates. There we go. Matthew, thank you for joining us. Oh, thanks um, for having me. I, I This was one of my favorite, doc, any type of sport documentaries I've seen in quite some time. Just because Thank you know the access and everything, I was I saw it early. Told my friends it was comparable to the animal version of the Last Dance, given the access mm -hmm. and like the team and the player that were being kind of focused on. And but the, the difference is between those docs is that was like a ten year ten year reign, and you had almost actually more than two decades because you had to cover the pre Brady and era as well. I, I'm just kind of curious when you came into this what was your strategy given all the material you had of what you wanted to like go in and cover it in a way where you had all this material but like you didn't want to leave out service or subject matter and you wanted to give the audience the best experience for over that 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 reign yeah you know it's interesting whenever i um have directed or written or produced um, a doc before, one of the things that I'm always trying to do is to figure out what the central theme or the central question is that we're trying to answer as we sort of go on this journey, whether it be 90 minutes in some cases or 10 parts um, in this one. And I, I'll never forget, I was um, interviewing the director of football research, a guy named Ernie Adams. And, you know, he said in our first ever interview, he said, Every team says that they want to go to the Super Bowl every year, but not every team is willing to do what it takes to get there. And I think that that question of what does it take to get there became sort of the, the guiding principle, if you will, of everything that we did going forward in that we were never going to be as concerned over what games we were going to show, what, what, what storylines we were going to follow as much as it was, how does the thing that we're putting into this answer that central question and to focus as little on the sport as possible and as much on sort of the human story and, and the interactions between these people, because in that question of what does it take to get there, you find something that's much broader than sports. That's a, that sort of, you know, applies to many different people and professions and things in life that just are universal. So I think that that was our guiding principle and, and that guided everything. The, the the team, this team isn't exactly one that was like super like chatty over the years. In fact, I think I think it was Devin McCourty who made a point that like the Patriot way in a way was like you just didn't talk off the field, like don't make it a distraction. I, I'm curious if you talk about the access and how, how that all kind of came together. And also like, was there any particular person where you were like, oh my gosh, we actually get to talk to this person? I never thought we would get them. Well, um, in, in an interesting way, the access part of this is very similar. I, the, the first film that I directed, Tiger, um, was the opposite of this one in a lot of ways. It was it was a film from the outside looking in. We didn't have Tiger. We didn't have his inner circle. Um, and so what we were doing is we were talking to people who had been part of his life that could shed some light on, um, you know, who he was and what made him a, a, a human being and what made him tick. And, you know, 
it, it was sort of the same thing here, even though it wasn't people, it, this time it was people in the inner circle. What you do is you call people up and normally the first question that they say is sort of, you know, what's your, what's your agenda? What's your, what are you trying to do here? And I always tell people, I, you know, that I really don't have one, even though we even had a book that this was based off of, you can't take words on a page and feed them into a computer and make a documentary out of it. So um, it's really a process of listening and say, and I tell people all the time, like you're the narrator of the story, what you say guides what the story becomes. And so it, for, for me and for all, the team of people that I was working with, it was really just a process of listening and gaining these people's trust. And, um, you know, that was, that was sort of, that, that was the way it went with almost everybody. And some people, you know, they take, they take one phone call to get them in the chair. And then some people you have to build up trust with over a period of a year. And, and eventually they decide to sit down. So you get them to sit down. And we, again, we get back to this as a team that was just not like talking over the years, I guess my, my, what, but it, again, this goes back to what they kind of said is like, where they weren't allowed to talk. I remember the team Trump kind of epi politics where they were frustrated with Bell's letter. And like, we, we wanted to speak. Did you feel that you had to go in and pull it out of them? Or did you think a lot of these guys had it so built up that they wanted to come out, whether good or bad, and say something? I think it was a mixture of both, as you can imagine, right? Some people were ready to talk out of the gate. And then some people you really had to, you had to figure out what it was that they had been, you know, that, I mean, first off, you're absolutely right. This is a team that, if anything, you know them to be cagey and not really saying anything in public. So that was one of the bigger questions, I think, as we started this whole thing. And then <clears throat> I think that what I tried to make clear to everybody is that I don't really have, you know, anything that I'm specifically going after. I want you to tell me what, what it was like to be there because nobody's really heard that story before. And then as I talked to one person, it would give me insight to something that nobody had ever really heard of before. And then I would sort of follow that trail and ask everybody about that. And then that would unravel and you'd start to get all these new storylines that go well beyond the headlines and go well beyond sports. And so I think really, you know, most of my interviews are at least three hours. Sometimes, um, you know, interviews lasted as long as five, seven hours, something like that. And over the course of that time, when a person's in the interview chair, you really get to know them. And I try to keep the interview process as conversational and casual as possible. And I think that that helps to um, build up trust and rapport and, and, and get people to talk about how they really felt. Well, the one specific person, um, so you, you said you, you didn't talk to Tiger in your Tiger doc, but Brady was with you front and center. Now he's, he is someone that, you know, it talks over the years, has a podcast, et cetera, but he's also very calculated. Did, like, did you feel that he was opening up more and more? Because I did feel in some sense he was being diplomatic on some parts and other parts he really wanted to do, have an almost like chip on your shoulder F you response he wanted to give. Like, how did you feel as that, that interview went along with like one of the hardest people to get a good answer out of? <laughs> I thought with Tom Brady that, um, you know, before I made this project, I really wasn't a Patriot fan. So I didn't know all that much about them other than, sort of, as you pointed out, that they're hard, to, they're a hard egg to crack and then, or tough, not, tough nut to crack, sorry. And then, uh, you know, and, and, you know, that they beat people at, in football games quite a bit. But after I started to do the research, I think I started to see what you're referring to with Tom and his, in, in a lot of his interviews where he gives the answer and it's not that revealing. And I think that when you, when you watch his interview in in our series, what you see is Tom Brady, who was more vulnerable than he has been in the past and really went to places that he hasn't really gone before, even in his own doc series. And I think that, you know, it helped that we had interviewed his family for one thing, but also, um, you know, just... I think by the time we got to him, because he was later in the interview process than all, everybody else, we we had collected so much information that our questions could just be a lot more pointed and and really get to the heart of what we were asking. And I think he could see that we had done the research. And I think, you know, the same honestly could be said for Bill Belichick. I remember after the first day that we interviewed him, he got up and he said, well, you've clearly done your research. And uh, coming from him, that obviously meant a lot. I, I want to talk a little bit on the editing of it. I, when I interviewed Brian Grazer, he talked about how much he loved how they ended and like it had like a like a real movie cinematic feel. With the, like so, when that cliffhanger, how you chose to end each episode was that like 
organic or did you kind of premeditate how you wanted to leave the, the audience wanting more for each episode? Well, I grew up reading, you know, Hardy Boy books. And what I remember most from them is that the way that the author always got you to change, turn the page and read the next chapter is by ending, you know, they'd be, they'd be running around trying to find somebody and then all of a sudden a gun would appear and that's how the last sentence of the chapter would end. And, and I, I don't think that we knew what those endings were going to be, but it's certainly something that we consciously did as we started to shape an entire episode. And, and these episodes with the editing team, Dan Kohler, Nick Diagetti, Freddie Shanahan, and a team of about 10 different editors were all collectively sharing on this uh, process. We knew we wanted to have those cliffhangers, but it was constantly changing and to the point where you know, entire, entire parts of an episode would be lopped off, uh, you know, out of nowhere. And then we would change the beginning and end. And what we knew was the basic building blocks of the stories that we wanted to tell in the A story. But then I think one of the most important things to our ability to tell the story the right way and to tell it in a way where you weren't just doing a chronological sort of timeline video of the, of the Patriot story was the, the use of flashbacks. So, Um, you know, in episode one, we flash back to Bill Belichick's days in Cleveland, but we do that. We use that technique throughout the entire show. And what that does is I think two things that were really important for us. One is that you, you don't have to show everything, right. And you don't have to show every game. It it says to you, you know, we're going to, we're going to leave the A, the the A storyline. We're going to go someplace else. And that, that thing that we're going to go to is going to elucidate what's going on in the A story. And then We're going to come back and we might be in a completely different time. We might be a year later. The other thing that I think it really does that we really like is, you know, we know that everybody's attention spans are hard to fight for, right? People are watching this and they're watching it with their phone in their lap. There's somebody sitting next to them who wants to talk to them. And one of the things that having the flashback does in in our minds, at least, is it keeps people on their toes. They never feel like they know where the thing is going to go and they don't know where they're going to escape the A story and be thrust into the, into the flashback part of it. And I think that the combination of those two things, the freedom that gives you and sort of keeping the audience on their toes, I think are really, really important things and something that we really uh, focused on. And then, yeah, the flashbacks were, or the, um, the cliffhangers rather were really, really important for us, I think, because, um, you know, especially if this was going to be, a series that was doled out, you know, one week at a time, as opposed to a binge. Um, It it was really important to make people want to come back for the next episode. And um, I think that, you know, it it just seemed like the right way to tell the story. So it's all come out now and you've gotten your reactions. And I think it's good reactions. Like I'm shocked the Patriot Nation doesn't love everything about this. Ah, (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But do you, um, it, do you, are you happy with how you uh, it all went out, or was there was there maybe five more minutes of something you wanted to get into, or five minutes you would take out of, or, or are you pretty happy with the final product? No, I honestly, um, one of the great things about working with Apple and Imagine is that we were given the time to tell the story the way that we wanted to, and um, sometimes that came in the form of time, and it also came in the form of having be able to hire 10 editors and, and being able to have this massive team. I mean, when we started, just to give you a sense of the archive on the project, um, you know, we had these little tapes that were about the size of a credit card, right, uh, in, in the Patriot archive, which we were given access to. And if you put those in, in, in you know, in Mac trucks, it would have filled up two Mac trucks uh, to, to give you a sense. It's 30,000 hours. So the amount of time that it takes to just look through that material with a team of 50 plus uh, loggers and, and APs and, and different people. I mean, it was just incredible. So we could tell so many different versions of the story. I think the one thing that we wanted to really focus on was that this was going to be the unvarnished telling of the story. I think there's a lot of, a lot of docs that come out these days that, that I've, I've had people say this to me that, you know, they feel like they're not getting the, the full story and the sort of the edges mm-hmm. of everything are getting buffed out in post. And one of the things that I really wanted to focus on here was making sure that this was the unvarnished telling of the New England Patriots, because as you pointed out, the thing that we know about them is that we've gotten a very sort of, you know, the, the image that they've wanted uh, to show, not, not what's really going on behind the walls of uh, Patriot Place. Well, Matthew, thank you very much. I look forward to LeBron probably calling you and wanting to do do his doc. No, now no, that you've done no, no, I don't know about uh, that. But, uh, 
<laughs> yeah. But thank you again for joining us. 